Welcome to the Deep Dive. We're here to sift through stacks of info, pull out the key insights, and basically give you that shortcut to being well-informed. Today, we're uh, really getting into the core of business finance, how basic financial statements are put together. We'll actually build them step by step right from the adjusted trial balance. But before we really dive in, just a quick heads up. This deep dive draws heavily on material from Farhat Lectures. All the content, the examples, the explanations, they're all derived from the great accounting resources over at farhatlectures.com. So whether you're studying accounting, prepping for the CPA exam, or you're already a professional, definitely check out the website. They've got extra practice questions, video lectures, loads of support to help nail down what we talk about today. Big thanks to Professor Farhat for this material. Absolutely. And this is uh, part three, right, of a four-part series looking at the whole accounting cycle. Getting how these statements come from the adjusted trial balance is, well, it's fundamental mm -hmm. because these numbers, they're the final kind of up-to-date figures. They reflect everything, all the transactions, all the adjustments. They're ready to go. Okay, let's unpack that. The adjusted trial balance is our starting point. You said it's crucial. Now, for our listeners, many know the basics, but why is this specific point, the adjusted trial balance, so vital for the, you know, the integrity of the statements we're about to build? It's like having that perfectly organized toolkit, right? That's a really good analogy. Yeah. What's fascinating is that adjusted part. That's where accrual accounting really does its work. It ensures revenues are matched up with the expenses used to earn them, which isn't always when the cash changes hands. So the numbers you see there cash, accounts receivable, supplies, whatever, they didn't just poof, appear. They've mm -hmm. gone through a careful process. You start with the unadjusted trial balance, transaction by transaction. You layer in those important adjustments, and that gets you to this final refined or adjusted trial balance that gives a much truer picture of performance than just looking at cash flow. You know, it sets the stage. Right. So it's about precision moving beyond just raw numbers into something more interpretive. Okay, we've got this refined data set. Now comes the art turning these numbers into a story. So where do we kick things off? Which statement tells the first part of that story? We always start with the income statement. Always. This statement tells you pretty simply, did the company make a profit or a loss? And crucially, it's for a specific period of time. Like for the period ending October 31st, X4. Think of it as a financial video showing what happened operationally over that month or quarter or year. Okay, profit or loss. And how do we figure that out? It sounds like just revenues minus expenses. That's the core of it, yes. It's quite straightforward on the surface. Mm. You take your revenues and you subtract your expenses. So in the example from our source material, there's service revenue, specifically consulting revenue of $15,000. Now, companies might have lots of different revenue streams, but we're keeping it simple here. From that $15,000, you deduct all the expenses listed. In this case, they add up to $11,350. Right. And this is where it gets interesting, isn't it? How do those numbers actually tell us if it was a good period or not? Well, you do the math. $15,000 in revenue minus $11,350 in expenses. That gives us a net income of $3,650. And uh, just a note on convention, you usually single underline the subtotal of expenses and then double underline that final net income figure. Since revenues were higher than expenses, it's a net income the company made a profit. And this number, this $3,650, it's critical because it flows directly into the next statement we prepare. Okay, so that $3,650 net income figure, it's like the output of the first process, but the input for the next one. Why do we do the statement of retained earnings next and how exactly does it link back to that income statement? You nailed it, it's the link. We absolutely need that net income figure or net loss, if that was the case from the income statement. Without it, you can't prepare the statement of retained earnings. This statement also covers a period of time, just like the income statement, and it basically explains how the company's retained earnings changed during that period. It shows what the company did with its profit. Okay, retained earnings. Can you break that down a bit? What exactly does that term mean? Sure. Retained earnings. Uh, it's essentially the accumulated profit the company has kept over its entire life, minus any dividends it's paid out to shareholders. It's the profit that's been retained in the business, reinvested, rather than distributed. Now, for a brand new company like the one in our example, the beginning retained earnings would be zero. Makes sense, right? No prior periods, no prior profit. The formula is pretty simple. Beginning retained earnings plus the net income we just calculated yeah. or minus a net loss. Then subtract any dividends paid out. Right. And that equals your ending retained earnings. Okay, that makes sense. It tracks the cumulative profit that stays in the company. So applying that formula to our example. Right. So we start with zero beginning retained earnings. We add the $3,650 net income from the income statement. 
Then the example shows the company paid out $3,000 in dividends, so we subtract that. Zero plus 3,650 minus 3,000 gives us an ending retained earnings balance of $650. So this $650 summarizes what happened the profit earned less what was given back to owners. And again, this ending figure is important. It becomes the beginning retained earnings for the next period, say for November. It just keeps rolling forward. Got it. So $650 represents the portion of this period's profit kept in the business. It's a bridge between performance and position. Which brings us finally to the balance sheet. I hear this one's uh, structurally different from the first two. It is, yeah. Very different in one key aspect. Unlike the income statement and the statement of retained earnings, which cover a period of time like a month or a year, the balance sheet is a snapshot. It's at one specific point in time. For example, as of October 31st, X4. If the income statement is the movie and retained earnings summarizes the savings for the movie, the balance sheet is like a photograph, a still picture of the company's financial condition right at that moment. And it shows that fundamental accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. A equal L plus E. Okay. Assets, liabilities, equity. Let's quickly define those in this context. What falls into each bucket? Sure. Assets are basically everything the company owns that has future economic value. Think cash. Accounts receivable money owed to the company's supplies, equipment, even something like accumulated depreciation, which technically reduces the asset's book value. In our example, the total assets add up to $96,750. Then... Liabilities. That's everything the company owes to outsiders, its obligations. Things like notes payable, accounts payable, money owed by the company unearned revenue, interest payable, salaries payable. In the example, these total $46,100. And finally, equity. This is the owner's claim on the assets, the residual interest. It mainly includes common stock, that's the capital investors put in $50,000 here, and the retained earnings we just calculated, that's $650. So total equity is $50,650. And here's the magic, right? Why it's called the balance sheet. How does it all tie together? Exactly. Because it has to balance. That's the cornerstone of double entry bookkeeping. Look at the numbers. Total liabilities, $46,100, plus total equity, $50,650. What does that equal? $96,750. Right. And what were the total assets? $96,750. They match perfectly. Precisely. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. $96,750 plus $46,100. It demonstrates that everything the company owns, its assets, had to be financed somehow, either by borrowing from others, liabilities, or through investment by the owners in accumulated profits equity. If those two sides don't match, you know immediately there's an error somewhere in the accounting process. It's a fundamental check. Wow. Okay. So stepping back, we've just walked through building three statements that are really interconnected. Mm. The income statement shows the profit. Mm -hmm. For a period. The statement of retained earnings shows what happened to that profit. Again, for the same period. And the balance sheet shows the company's financial position, what it owns and owes at the end of that period, incorporating that retained profit. Exactly. You see how they link. Net income flows to retained earnings, mm. and the ending retained earnings balance flows into the equity section of the balance sheet. They tell a cohesive story together. It really paints a clear picture. Profit, how it's managed, and the overall financial standing. Which brings up a good point. Maybe something for you to think about. Why is it so important, really, to get this? Even if this was just an overview, why is understanding how these basic statements are built and what they represent so vital? Think about how these concepts form the bedrock for everything else financial analysis, making investment decisions, managing a business, whether you're in school or in your career, this stuff matters. That's a great point. It's the foundation for so much financial understanding and decision making. And if you do want to dig deeper, really solidify this, we strongly suggest investing in yourself by checking out those extra resources. Head over to farhatlectures.com. You'll find more lectures, practice questions, exercises, everything to help you master this. And definitely join us next time. We'll be tackling the next step in the cycle. Closing entries, really bringing it all full circle.